Uh, welcome to our program, Here We Are. I'm Henry Cheatham, the host of uh, this program, as well as the producer of the program. And on our line today, I'm interviewing uh, uh, an accomplished coach, baseball college coach, uh, Mr. Uh, coach Roger Kadar. I hope I got his name right. He got one of the most funny names. He's out of Louisiana, so you'll know why. <laughs> and Coach, Coach uh, Kadar has a, uh, a book out, and it's called Against All Odds, which uh, many of us have been up against that. And he's going to talk to us about his book and as well as the uh, status of where he see baseball is today. You know, and... Uh, the book is a wonderful read. It's a it's paper a softback book, and it was published and uh, written and published in 2014. And it is published by the Kadar and Kadar Publishing Company. Welcome to our program, Coach. Mr. Cheatham, it's truly a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk with you again. Right, right. It's always wonderful to hear your voice as well, you know. So how you been doing and how things been going with you? Well, you know, life is good. You know, we're all trying to get through COVID-19, this pandemic, and it's affected our lives and forced us all to make adjustments. But you know what? We're getting through it. Hopefully, in the next few months, we can put everything behind us. Yeah, that's I agree with you on that. You know, it's uh, it's been a little, uh, it been really tiresome. You know, it's uh, one of those things where you said, "Dog, what the hell?" You know, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And it's uh, really stressful. You know, so you're not alone in this stuff today. It's uh, all of us uh, stressed. Right. You know, when we're dealing with this, you know. Uh, of course, I want to talk to you about your book, Against All Odds. What made you write it, and what were the odds against you? Uh, and you can also, in telling us, uh, as you introduced us, talk about your book. You can tell us about yourself, you know, young man. Well, I'm back in the backwoods of Louisiana. That's right. How you made it to the big city of Baton Rouge, and he was a, a very yeah. different guy. Well, for many years, uh, if I start with there were many years people were trying to get me to write a book. Mm -hmm. But if I can go back before we started writing the book, you have to tell why am I writing the book? You, you got to have a start. You got me? Yes, sir. What, and the start was that here was a kid that was denied the basic uh, privilege of going to school uh, and learning how to read, write, and arithmetic because I grew up on the farm in the Jim Crow South era and everybody, the only school we went to was to register and then go to pick out and work in the field and you never, only time we went to school was in the winter months when it was cold and there was no crop, no farming, you got me? Yes. And well, we registered because of the law and then you don't go back. How could someone learn? And that's what we do. So December, Fe January, February were the three months we were in school, and then we were out of school again. See, September, October, November, no school. Uh, March, April, May, no school. <laughs> so, you know, that's what we were dealing with. So you never learned the basic fundamentals of what you, were, you should be in school. So I was denied that for so many years until I was able to figure something out and at 12 or 13 years old convinced my father I didn't want to do what he was doing that had no future that I wanted to go to school and boy I tell you we were fortunate though when I look at my family situation and when you say how could you be fortunate we grew up in a small community, maybe three, four hundred people, and everybody had 10, 12 kids. All the people had, they needed a bunch of kids to work, you got me? Yes. We only had three. <laughs> so we weren't designed, we were not designed to work the field because you only had three kids. 
you need a multitude of people. And uh, so, you know, my brother and sister. And the other thing is we were all two years apart, which I don't understand, you know, how that happened, but it happened. And finally, I convinced my daddy, please, I don't want to do this. Let me go to school. Oh, it was a battle. And finally he said, son, go. Mm -hmm. Go. And, you know, the thing is, once I went, I went off the basketball team and got cut. And even though I got cut, I went back the next day, and the next day, and the next day. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and the coach who cut me, and he's the only coach still alive. Mm -hmm. And I really believe there's a reason he's still alive, because he, can, he tells the story that he cut me, that he cut me, and I came back. And you know what? Being in a rural area, he was my only ride home. If, I, if he didn't ride, let me ride home, I had to walk 10 miles, okay? <laughs> so he allowed me to ride with him, and every day he dropped me off, even though he cut me. And every day he, every time he saw me after that, and I ended up being a decent player as time went along, and then I went to college, and then I signed with the Atlanta Braves. Even though basketball was my thing, I went to college on a basketball scholarship. He often said, I cut many kids. They all accept, they all accept it, except you. <laughs> and I'm so happy you didn't accept it because you've helped a lot of other kids. And I said, that's really was something special because I often tell him, this stay in your ground rule, this thing with stay in your ground was a problem. Had he stood his ground, he would have gotten me out of the gym. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I said, God seals your lip and he allowed you to continue to do good things and let me stay in there because I was the unpolished person that was going to do a lot of good things to so many more people because of him let me stay in there Man. and I can say to you Mr. Cheatham I can say to you when, my, when that coach saw me after college, he cried every time he saw me mm. because he knew he I cut this young man. I cut him. I mean, he did the right thing. <laughs> if you go based upon on, on people with athletic ability and performance, he did the right thing to cut me. Mm. But there's more to death that meets the eye. You can cut people, but maybe that's not the right thing to do because the people, athletic ability shouldn't be all the reason why you cut somebody. You got me? Yes. But so that's the thing that happened. And, 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 and my thing is, as a coach at Southern University, I had a problem cutting people. Okay. I used to keep kids around and everybody badgered me. Why are you keeping this kid around? He can't play. <laughs> and I looked at him and smiled and pointed to me. You're looking at one that couldn't play. Yeah. You're looking at a guy that couldn't play. You see, you see, so, and, and you know, the most uh, decorated story being from Chicago, Michael Jordan. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. He was cut. You got me? Right. You know, if you guys do your research, Michael Jordan was cut yeah. from the JV team. You remember that? Oh, yeah. You know, so people get cut. It doesn't mean that they, it's just that somebody at the time saw that they maybe wasn't worthy of making the team, you know? Yeah. But being in a rural area that I was in, being in a rural area that I was in, you know, uh, it was tough for me to, for them to do that. You know, uh, and I was able to survive it. Mm. That's a good thing, yeah. Uh, I noticed that you, 
Approximately, uh, what are your principles of uh, when you did coach a young man? What was your principles? You know, what did you have certain principles you try to uh, convey to them? Well, it was simple. I realized coaching at a historical black school, mm -hmm. you had to coach different and teach different values. Black kids who go to top five colleges or conference, power conference, mm -hmm. they're going there to do what? To win, you got me? Yes. Historical black schools are not going to win. Let's not fool ourselves. And so many people fool themselves, you got me? Uh, yeah, I, I realize when they're giving you $20,000, you actually think they're trying to get you to win a national championship? Only a fool would believe that, you got me? It sounded like this woman who said just, who was saying that the, the uh, election was a fraud and now that she's in trouble and said, only foolish people would believe. Mm -hmm. You got me? Yes. Only stupid people would believe that something happened. You got me? Yes. So my point is, it's the same thing. Only a fool, if you coach at a historical black school, would believe that they're trying to give you money to win a national championship, right? Yeah. So you take what they're giving you and then you understand that you got to help the kids to be fundamentally sound in all of the things that go help them to be successful in life. Right. Like being a gentleman, good dress, being punctuated on time, being kind to people, asking questions, being a good a good person that's gonna be a good husband, a good father, a good citizen in the community. All of those things is what I try to teach. Because I thought they had value. And to me, they did have value. Yeah, they still have value. <laughs> yes, they, that's the truth. I agree with you on that. <clears throat> Approximately, you know, in, in reading your book here, I see that you uh, uh, you, were, you came out of a little town in, uh, and you pronounced it for me. <laughs> Ventress. Ventress, Louisiana, right. About 300 people yeah. at best. Uh, and, just, you know, it was a strictly a farming community. And, uh, you know, nobody ever went to school, to college. If they graduated high school, they did well. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they did well if they went to, to college. Yeah. I don't think but three or four, maybe five people from that community during my era mm -hmm. went to beyond high school. So it tells you. What would the odds are? You got me? Yeah. I know you went to Rosenwald High School. Rosenwald High School. That's right. Yeah. And Rosenwald High School got some, got some, it's amazing that it has some Chicago uh, <laughs> entity. Mm. A Jewish guy by the name of Rosenwald mm. with fears and robots. Yeah, okay. He decided that in the South he was going to build schools for African American kids. Yeah. You are aware of that? Uh, I'm, I'm aware of Rosenwald, yeah. Well, yeah, that's what he did. Yeah. He was one of the big guys with Sears and Robot. Yeah, now that you mention that, yes, I'm familiar with that, yeah. yeah. And he decided he was going to build schools in the South for black kids. That's a beautiful thing. And that's See, that's why you interviewed me. We helping people understand. Out of Chicago mm -hmm. was a Jewish guy. Yeah. That helped the people in the South. Yeah, that's true. And this is why I tell people, my people, if you don't have information, you can't really do a, a really good interview yeah. that is going to be productive and help people. You got me? Yeah, I got you. I mean, there's one of my favorite, favorite quotes. is by a gentleman <clears throat> named uh, Mr. Edward J. Williams. And he's out of Snow Hill, Alabama. And he wrote a book, 25 Years in the Black Belt. That's the name of the book, the title of the book. And it's about when the end of uh, in, the enslavement of our people, and we're coming out of that period, now what people are going to do? 
And as he points out, it's, uh, he, he, he point, one of the quotes that I use is that ignorance is the most costly crop that any community can produce. And to me, those are some very powerful words, spoken over 100 years ago. Right. You know, he was uh, very, you're right about that you should try to learn something about yesterday because, you know, if you do, you might make it to, to, uh, through to tomorrow. It, you might, and I'm telling you, I hear people all the time who are considered to be extremely educated and smart, but they don't know about the history. You got me? Yeah. The history determines the future. And so what it is. Extent, yeah. You know, and the one thing is I'm not very smart, but damn it, I'm going to tell you one thing. I've done some research that will allow me to have a conversation. <laughs> That's what it's about. It will let me have a conversation <laughs> yeah. with people and be able to, to give information out. And that good. You see, and I realized that. I realized it because I was deprived mm -hmm. of an opportunity to be very well-versed by the system. Yes. But I didn't let the system continue to to beat me down. You got me? Right on. Uh, so that's why I started reading and got I could be I could be in a lot of places and be able to hold a conversation. Yeah. Because I went and started reading and, and dig up information. Oh, yeah. So I wanted to be I never know and I told I told my son, you know, what makes me effective if that in any damn conversation I'm in, wherever I am, I'm gonna be able to talk, hold a conversation. The worst and most uncomfortable thing can happen. You're in a situation, people talking about something. You have nothing, no understanding about. Right. That's a very what bad. What happens is that you you leave. You leave. So you keep you 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 feel too embarrassed to ask a question. You know which you should be able to do, but like, you know you won't do that. You know because you feel that you don't know how to ask that question. I'm going to ask you about, you, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you about uh, Eli Giroux, I think. I'm not a great at French, but uh, one of your guys in your book you wrote about, you know, whatever happened to him, uh, any of them still around uh, that you know. With father understand, under, understated approval, I had broken free from the shackles of sharecropping and what, ha what seemed to be uh, a dead-end existence to me, no matter how many crops we harvest each year, landowner, Eli, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 that, that yeah, land, that, yeah. Yeah, no matter how many crops we, he always told we broke even at 12 years old. <laughs> yeah. I told my daddy, something ain't right. Yeah. I said, something ain't right here. <laughs> and boy, that man looked at me, and my daddy grabbed me by my arm and took me out of that store. Son, don't you say nothing like that. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Eli, Jeff, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. He was the owner. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> is, is, any his, uh, is any of his people still around? Uh, if I can give you a, sto a story. Yes. I was at Whole Food two years ago. Yes. And I went to the restroom, and then I, w I got a phone call from a sportscaster. And I was doing an interview. And there was a guy, and then he heard the voice. And he waited and waited and waited. I got out, and uh, he said, you a Coach Kedar, aren't you? I said, yes, I got worried. <laughs> he said, I'm going to tell you who I am. He said, <laughs> he said I'm a great I'm a descendant of Eli General. I said, really? He said, yeah, you put something in, in your book about him, and there are a lot of, of my people are angry with you. <laughs> because they <laughs> are wrong. S say that again. I did a lot of bad things. Uh-huh, yeah. You know, and I said, I said, oh, everything in my book is, uh, is true. I said, so... I'm sorry to tell you about your great grandfather. Mm -hmm. He took advantage of the less fortunate. Yeah. You know. So 
that's the kind of guy and the thing is this guy he stole the land from his family mm -hmm. and you know the sad thing is that and that's what the one thing I try to tell people all the property he had thousands and thousands and thousands of acres he never got to enjoy it yeah okay yeah, let's go. <laughs> with people that get thousands of acres and yeah. of millions and millions of dollars right. and never get to enjoy it. Yeah. None of those people ever left that area. Yeah. They didn't go no further than Baton Rouge, which was 20 miles away. They never did anything. Mm -hmm. And years later, one of the sons, my brother, remained in the area. And one of the, the sons of Eli Jarrell told him, my son, my brother only went to food grade, and the man said to him, you were the smart one. <laughs> Your brother was the dumb ASS. I don't know if I can say that. Yes, you can say it. You know, you know. He said, Your brother was the dumb ass. <laughs> and my brother is looking at him, and he's, and it took him. He said, really? He didn't say anything to him. So my brother called me and told me that. He said, can you believe that man told me that you, I'm the smart one, you're the dumbass? And he said, even I can figure that out, that you are the smart. But you see, that was the thing, the brainwashing. Yes. That they did, you see. Yes. They were angry with me because I broke a loose. Yeah. And I helped my family to tell them, don't do this anymore. You know, let's move forward with life. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Right, I got you. And that's the beauty, the things I've done. But there was a lady, one of the daughters in there, mm. who ran the post office. Okay, yes, I saw that story, yes. Go on. And she just, she knew something was different about me because... I used to come and get a newspaper every day. I would mail letters from there. Mm -hmm. Nobody else was doing that. And one day, in a in a really good moment, she said to me, when none of her brothers and were around, where they would badger her, she said, "Don't let them kill your dream. Don't let them kill your dream." See, I know that God gave women a certain compassion. Mm -hmm. That they love what is right. You got me? Yeah. That woman told me that. She told me that. Don't let them kill your dream. Who else could she be talking about? Who was killing dreams? <laughs> her brothers. Yeah. Grandfather. Uh, her father. Yeah. Her family. Those were the people killing dreams. You got me? Oh, yeah. So... I had, that's what it, I was able to write about that. Yeah. And, you know, you know, so it is what it is. Yeah. So I have, I'm sorry if I went off. No. But that was a compassionate moment. No, no. No, no. That's, what, know, that, that's what this interview is about you, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you got to say, I asked you a question about the book. I mean, it ain't in the book or whatever. But it, well, you know, it's in the book. That's yes, I know it's in the book. Yeah, I know you've yeah. talked about this white lady who uh, you told you those words, you know. Oh, uh, Now, where, where in Louisiana did your father come from? He came from the same area. Uh, Remember, let me just say this. Now, my family, 200 years past, came from Haiti. They of Haitian descent. Okay, all right. And they they they, they came in that area, and uh, uh, and let's face it, that was uh, you know, I don't know if you ever heard of the the song, the singer Ernie Cato. Oh yeah. Well, he spelled his name different, but he's a, he was the first cousin of my father. Okay. All of them were right there, but he left. And his father left, and they went to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So then he was able to make a different life for himself. You got yeah. me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of your uh, 
ancestry. So you, uh, your folks are from uh, came from Haiti. And thank God for Haiti. Let nobody ever put down the Haitians. Without the Haitians, you would not have this great country of ours. You know that, that Louisiana Purchase was a mess, and uh, uh, Tucson Elcho was a, a, a great fighter. You know what I'm saying? Right. Thank God for Haitians. I know what they made, what they mean to the United States. I, oh, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah. yeah. You know they've done they did a lot. You know. Yeah. To help and uh, you know it's just it's amazing. Yeah. Hey Kim. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Back to your book now. You that was uh. Uh, what was that? There was a principal. Well, you were talking about your principal you, uh, who uh, saw that, that you as a young man had uh, some potential in you. Uh, you were saying that he, uh, uh, that he was a lady who put her arms around you. And what's, uh, I was wondering, oh, okay, yeah, I got that, yes. But anyway, that, that, that was part of it that I had here in the, on one of my notes here. And sometimes, you know, notes get you lost. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, but continue to talk about yourself and your book and your family. <laughs> that's yeah. what this interview is about. <laughs> now, right. Well, the thing is, you know, like I said, my family, they had, you know, the, the biggest, the, let me tell you, I, I, I had, I really landed in two good situations. Okay. You got to land with people who talk. Back in the days in the South, black men didn't talk a lot. They didn't have nothing good to talk about for a large extent. You got me? So they didn't talk a lot. So where did black men talk? Where did they go to talk? The barber shop? Right. I was going to ask you about and that, Mr. Moses. And and the the right on. Well, the barber shop was next door to me, and the guy who cut hair... And I got to be real good friend. He was older than I, but he took a liking to me and he helped me and he, we did because he would talk and I learned a lot from it. But my grandfather ran the saloon and he talked to me all the time. We would go sit under the big oak tree and he would tell me great stories. <laughs> well, he was qualified to do it because he heard the stories in the saloon. That's why people went and been out. They had a drink, and they talked about what was going on in their life. You got me? Yeah. So that's why I was able to get information from men, two men, who talked, and they were experienced people. Uh -huh. Rather than talk to someone your age, you, I'm never talking to someone my age wasn't going to get me no information. You got me? Right. So I was talking to my grandfather. And a guy named Money, Stafford Nelson, who cut hair, I was getting information. I was getting information people my age weren't getting. Right. They were not getting this information. They were dealing with uh, people their age. And I thought, you know, I didn't put in my book, but I didn't hang out with many people my age. I'm going to be honest with you. I was a loner to start with. And the people I dealt with was the barbershop guy my grandfather, that was the people, to a large extent, that was the people I hung out with. Mm -hmm. So I had advantage. I was around the older men. Every chance I got, I was around the older men. And let me tell you, I remember Jesus in the Bible, they talked about he was around the older men. Yeah. And you get, that's why the wisdom, the seed of wisdom is over there. You got me? Right. Okay. So that's what I did. I went around and hung with them and listened and, uh, you know, and learned a lot of stuff that was able to prepare me to make better decisions right. as I was moving forward in life. Right. You know, you hear a lot of folks, you know, like uh, a lot of ladies say, well, I don't hang around ladies because I can't learn that much. But they hang, you know. They say, "Cause I can learn more from men," and it's the same thing about being a youngster. <laughs> yeah. you, you can learn much more from the, as we call them, the old people, yeah. <laughs> than you can. Well, uh, you know, you sure, you're that's where the seed of experience is. Yeah, that's right. They do. They experience stuff, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I mean, you know, uh, it's uh, you know, 
And like I said, it, it wasn't like it was planned. It just happened. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. You know. Now, uh, let's move forward here in your book. You know, you come back here. With, yeah, you were talking about the barbershop and all of that. Yeah, you talked about Ms. Inez. Yeah. Uh, now, once you got to, uh, you said basketball was your first choice? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But uh, you couldn't play. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> that was the first. Well, I tried. That, you know, yeah. I tried. That's the, that beat, that nothing beat failure, as they said, but a try. <laughs> That's right. I yeah. tried, and the thing is, I wasn't very good, okay? Yeah, but I mean, you was good. Yeah, but that was the thing that was going to get me out. Remember. Uh -huh. The one underlying thing that I had is that I couldn't fail. I couldn't go back home a failure. Yeah. Remember, I got my daddy to give up. Yeah. The only thing he knew how to do. Yeah. My daddy didn't know nothing else other than be a former. You right, know? right. That was it. Yeah, you're right. And when I got him to let me go to school, he had to do something else. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't go back home and be a failure. Yeah. Because... It would have seen that I got him to give up something and I wasn't worthy of the effort he made. You got me? Right, I got you. People don't think that way anymore, but I did. I couldn't go back home for you. So that's why I had to stick it out in basketball. I had to stay there. Mm -hmm. Well, let's I had to humble myself. Yeah, look at the cover on the back of your book here. You got the, uh, you're looking like Wilk Chamberlain. <laughs> uh, well, I'm far from Wilk. But, <laughs> you know, I look at, think about that three bedroom house, uh, kitchen, the bedrooms. I mean, we had, you know, again, there were them, the three bedrooms. Yeah. I know where 10, 12 kids were, were part of those three bedrooms. We only had three kids, so we were fortunate. You got yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. You know, when you start thinking about that there were 10, 12 kids in three bedrooms, that's really reality, okay? Yes. I don't know exactly how we had. Uh, we we had uh, about that many bedrooms. Uh, we, we had about, I don't forgot now, but uh, we was, I come from a family of 10, as you were saying. Where, uh, where you came from? Uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. Yeah, that's where I'm from, yes. When, we, yeah. when, you, when I think about that, you talk about that, I say, wait a minute. You know, yeah. you, you only had, what, three sisters and, uh, you know, three of you all. I say, what? <laughs> the average yeah, family. You had ten. <laughs> yeah. You had so, I mean, you know, like I said, we were fortunate. Yeah. You know? Because we were averaging about that, you know, 10. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, the average family, you know. It's, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what they had, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was average, and like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, when you go, go right on, apologize. And, 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 you know, people, I know one family had 20 kids. Mm. That woman was having a kid every year. Yeah. But fortunate in a bad situation, they were educators. Yeah. And they, a lot of those kids went off into college, you Good. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, later on in life, you know. But, uh, you know, uh, it's amazing, man, because they were in a different area than we were when I said that. The area I was in, I can only remember one other late person went to college. Okay. I mean, that's letting you know how difficult it was, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... You, you don't tell me that ain't... Is that not the biggest denial of op, of, of opportunity? You got me? Oh, definitely. You're, you're absolutely right. I come out of the... Uh segregated south you know i went to high school and all of that you know all you know and thank god we were, we were in the uh, more in the city you know and we were able yeah. you know make it to a certain point you know and thank god for that you know yeah y'all were in jackson so things were a little better when you're in the rural area right it was different you know we did own our own stuff and some of that stuff but we were not sharecroppers or farmers or any you know, of that kind you know which makes a big big difference you know when you were a sharecropper, you were working for free. <laughs> the only thing that man was paying for was that little three-bedroom house. He paid the water utility, and that was it. Mm, really? And you, and he made you believe that the fertilizer you got 
was more than all of the cotton and sugar cane you produce. Yeah. We were doing 40 acres. Okay. You mean that man was saying you broke even with that or what? I mean, even a 12-year-old kid like me knew something wasn't right. You got me? Yeah. Yeah, I got you. I, I was 12 years old. Yes. And I said, this ain't right. Mm. And my daddy took me out that store. That was the last time. And I guess them people said, you know, well, we also had, and I don't know if I, in my book if I talk about the party line. You see, I was also at 16 years old. I picketed a store that wouldn't hide black people and, you know. Yes. You know, they wouldn't do right by black people. And I picketed them. Right. And with that party line, they used to pick up and tell my mama, we see him, we go get him. He got to come home tonight. I was doing it in New Roads, which was 10 miles uh, from home. You got me? Yes. And I had to make it to from there. <laughs> A lot of times I walked. But my mother, who was not an educated woman, knew that she wasn't going to stop me, said to me, always you wear something black, and when you see a car, I want you to lay down in the ditch. That was very good advice, yes, she gave you. I saw huh? it. Yeah, that was very good advice. I saw what you had that in there, that she told you but that. here's yeah. a woman that was not, my mother maybe never went to school if she did. I don't even know. Mm. But she had enough sense to tell me, you know, and wear something black and lay down in the ditch. Yeah. When you say, because the, the, it's a one, it was a one road, road, you got me? Right. You're going to see a car coming from a long distance. Right. You got me? Oh, yes, I got you. I understand what you're And you, you ain't going to have many of them. Mm. And she said, lay down in the ditch flat. And I always made it home. Yeah, that's a good thing. I made it home every night. Yeah. We, yeah. Like I said, coming from the South, you know, you understand some of the stuff, you know. You have to fight your way in some areas, and <laughs> others you just, you know, you move through, and thank God that he brought you through, you know. Well, well you know, I would kids today. My son doesn't understand what his daddy went through. Yeah. He sees his daddy as who I am today, yeah. and he thinks I'm ready-made. I was ready-made. You understand? <laughs> yes. Because that's what they look at. Everything is ready-made, you know? Yeah, right. He never knew his daddy had to use an odd house. You got me? Yeah. You know, I was part of convincing my parents to get, to do, add a, to add a, a bathroom, and it was one of the best thing ever happened to him. I convinced him to do that. You got me? Yes. And I said, we can do it. I'll help buy. Pick for colors to buy. She just the fact that I uh, here's a kid telling them because they have been felt all along they didn't deserve it yeah and speaking you know, of uh, speaking of pecan picking it seems like you said they, they felt all along they didn't deserve it no one else in the community had it yeah and once true. we got it everybody else went and got it isn't that beautiful yes yes it's sort of like <laughs> What happened in 54 when the guy broke the sub four minute mile? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 If, yes. You, if you know about that situation. Uh, yeah, I do, I'm just, yeah, I do. Now that you're mentioning it, I do. It in the, might be in my book. I told I might have already thought about it. Yeah. But he broke it. Yeah, I think you, yeah, you did put that in your book. You're yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Yes, it was in here. Yes, it I, was a psychological barrier. Right. Once it was broken, it was easy for the next people to do it. Come back and I yeah. talked about in 43, uh, about the lady swimming to Catalina Island. Yeah. Nobody had swum to Catalina Island. Well, she did it, they were able to do it. Yeah. It broke the psychological barrier. So that's your, so exactly. once you do something, it's easy for the next person, you know, yeah, to do it. So, again, if I hadn't read about those things, I could not talk about them. You got me? Yes. I, I got a note in here said something about Joe Simpson. Yeah. Joe Simpson, no. Yes, Joe yeah. the Pro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to see. Was, Go right Joe on. the Pro. Joe the Pro 
Jordan Pro was uh, <laughs> whoa, what a you know I've never seen no one like him. Let me tell you, in the eighth grade he was a pro, mm-hmm. and he was a rarity. He was so unique. He was so unique. Because he was being called Jonah Pro in the eighth grade. Yeah. And here's the situation I found out. And I'm going to be able to talk about it because he told me. He, he, single mama, they lived behind, they lived behind a bar. And that tells you what a single mother lived behind a bar had to endure. You got me? Right. (laughs) Back in the days when, in the 50s and 60s. You know, she had to do her what men, uneducated, not very scrupulous, will say and do and go after her. You got me? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, that's the way it was. You know, they didn't have that. So, uh, and that's why he said he was, he said he grew up in the ballrooms as a great dancer. He said he was a great dancer. He grew up in the ballroom dancing because he was a great dancer and that told me a lot about his mother you got me yes how could you let your son go in there dancing you know what i'm saying yeah so but let's forget that when he came to basketball i realized he had done something that helped him to be who he was Mm -hmm. he just he had to have done something that made him so good Mm -hmm. so young so young he was so good but he was a physical specimen and then in the ninth grade he was really good and in the 10th grade and in the 11th grade (laughs) and then the 12th grade he was really everybody wanted him but there was a a, a scout from Louisiana Tech came to look at him yes and he said I need you to go to New Road to see a player by the name of Roger Kador, he's as good as me. And he, t- he and I, we, he and I had that conversation. I said, no way, Joe, you told that guy that. He said, yeah. He said, you're as good as I am. Well, the, I couldn't go to Louisiana and take my ECT. We didn't take tests. My grades were terrible. You know my situation. I was socially promoted. You understand what I'm saying? I couldn't have gone nowhere other than a HBCU. You got me? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Let's be realistic. I was realistic, okay? Mm-hmm. It sounds good. It was a feel-good story, but it wasn't going to happen, okay? And so, uh, so what happened is that... Uh, uh, that came in fast, and Joe Simpson, Joe Pro signed with Long uh, Cal State Fullerton, and uh, was the worst thing he ever did. He went to California because, again, he wanted the California life. Yeah, and uh, he came after a year, got in all kind of trouble over there, and then he determined. He needed to get out of there, and they let him out, and he came to Grandma, so he and I competed. Again, we had the uh, honor of competing against each other in basketball. He was at Grandma, and I was at Southern. So that's a great story, but this guy was as good. And, you know, you hear about people who were great and never made it. Mm-hmm. He's one. I wasn't much and I got to accomplish a lot. You got me? Yes. I should never have been able to accomplish half of what that man accomplished. You got me? But it goes to show you he grew up in a situation that wasn't conducive for him to to do that. He didn't have someone that was giving him the nourishment yeah. that he needed. He was really growing up on his own. You got me? Yeah. In a situation with the wrong people around him. You got me? Oh, yeah. Definitely. I got you. And he and I talked about two months ago. And he, he shared all of those things. He said, my life was a screw up. He said, I just didn't have the right people around me, you know? Yeah. But how, how is he doing today? 
he's doing good. He's going through some me- some stuff. He's do- uh, you know, but he's doing okay. Yeah, it's good. He's doing. He's trying to get everything in order. Mm. And he's a good person. Just you know, j- good people get in bad situations. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Is he back in Louisiana or where? He's back in Louisiana. Right. Uh, has a lot of has some legal issue, mm-hmm. and the people, the legal system, have used him to try and help other people, and that's what he's trying to do. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now you know. Okay, let's talk a little bit. Let's see uh, about you and your. How many players you think you? Uh, do you know how many players you sent to the major leagues? Eight players went to the major league. Sixty-four went to the signed professional contract. Good, that's good. And one of my players right now is Jose Deleon pitching with Cincinnati. Pitched a hell of a game last night against uh, Pittsburgh, and then we got Victor Caracchini catching with uh, San Diego. Good, uh, good. So I've, I've been fortunate. I had eight players. You know, not a lot of people can say that in their coach. You know how hard it is to send players to the big league? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though- and a school that didn't have the finances to develop people. Yeah. Now, how did you, how were you able to be uh, as successful? Well, you know, I know how to swag and the MEAC and all that is. How were you able to uh, really accomplish, you know, those things that you did accomplish there at Southern? Well, it all had to do with people trusting me. I built a trust system, a trust system that is unbreakable. Mm. And once you get a, tr- a trust system like that, it's hard to, to, to break, you know, and that's what happened. People trust me. They believed that I was going to do right by the kids. And I was going to develop them, and I did all of those things I said. I did just so. I did everything I said I was going to do. Mm-hmm. I didn't oversell or undersell. Okay. Now, and you were there with the competition of, uh, you know, LSU and all the rest of them there in, that, in the state. You were right there. Were you, were you, and you were you able to get uh, guys that thought they were going to go there, but you were able to pull them back to Southern? Well, I didn't, LSU and I were not in the same room competing, okay? Okay. We were not competing for the same players. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. You know, LSU weren't recruiting black kids, okay? Oh, okay. In numbers, you got me? All right. You know, and my thing is, I was recruiting the less fortunate kids. You know, inner city kids, kids in the, in the rural area. You know, that's, those are the people I was recruiting. Okay. Not a lot of people were recruiting them kids. Mm-hmm. I was recruiting underdeveloped kids and developing them. Kids that had potential that only a few people could determine. You got me? Yeah. They were not polished. You just needed to get a rag and polish them a little. You got me? Right. And put them in the right, in the, in the right environment type thing. Well, you know, you look at a, you know, it's always you say, I'm going to give them two years. Uh-huh. It's a two-year project. You got me? Okay. We were looking always with that. It's going to take a couple of years for that kid. It'll be okay. We do this every day. And that's really what we were doing. Not many people were going to get. Was going to get. We weren't going to get the polished black kid. The parents weren't going to give it to us. Give them, give the, us those players. Because they didn't think we were good enough. You got me? Yeah. And that's the way black, I hate to say that. And you know, in Chicago, they got a kid that's polished you. He ain't going to never, the parents never going to consider a black coach. And it's a shame. Yeah. It's disgraceful. 
But that's what they're going to do. And how do we get? To, how did they get to this point? It is pathetic. It's uh, it's always the same thing. It's like right now with this pandemic we're going through. They want to say, well, you know, black folks. Uh, you know, as many white folks with underlying condition as black folks. So what? Are they, you know, what the devil are you talking about? You know. So it's you know, it, it's a shame that you allow a person to tell you who you are. Yeah, you a lot of people, and that 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 baseball program in in Chicago, that is very successful. What's the name of it? Uh, you talking about the one with Radcliffe? Oh, well, I don't want to say Radcliffe, but the White Sox supported. I don't know if it's Radcliffe. Yeah, well, yeah, this, he's part of it. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned that they, the uh, opening day uh, tomorrow for the. Uh, <laughs> For Morgan Park. Whatever the name of that, that uh, what do you know the name of that t organization? Well, I think you're talking about the sports to start. What happened is the White Sox Park is a, is a, where the uh, in Illinois the sports complex is, and uh, the, 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 at White Sox Park. Uh, well, I don't. I wouldn't think Radcliffe is the one. I wouldn't let Radcliffe be ahead of nothing. I'm. But, you know, oh, okay, yeah. and I, he may be a friend of yours, but no, no, I, mean, I mean, I just, I support it, you know, I, I support yeah, the I, and I hate to use this on that, but I mean, it's uh, the uh, uh, I can't think of that name of the program, yeah, but it is, it's, have done a good job, it, well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, he's part of it because they practice, yeah, he it. may be a part, but you right. can't let him leave, oh, okay, You're better off letting him be a part, <laughs> you can't, that, you know, and my thing is, we've got to come to the understanding. Everybody is not a leader. That's They're right. Being a part. Right. And you a, got me? Yes, there's a great deal being a part of. Yeah, it, it, it has a lot of value being a part. Yeah. But leaders are difficult to find. It's a lot of sacrifice. If you let anybody be a leader, they're going to destroy something. Yeah. It's a great sacrifice you know, being a leader, you know. Yeah, you know, and so that's, that's the kind of thing that I try to make people understand. You know, don't don't try, you know, don't try to do more than you're capable of doing. Don't try to be something you're not. Let me tell you something. I could have been the athletic director at Southern, okay? Mm -hmm. But I, I turned it down twice because I was not a good fit to be a the AD there. You got me? Yeah. And it would have tarnished my value, you got me? You would have been asking someone to do something that they're not well-versed at doing, you got me? Yeah. Even though I've done a lot of things, I wasn't going to be a good athletic director. Because you hadn't thought about it, but yeah. Huh? Because you hadn't thought about it, possibly. Hey, I'm a baseball well, player. Let's not, play the I knew that what they wanted. Yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a yes man, okay? All right. I got you. You know, I'm not a yes man. I've always done things my way. And to be the AD, you got to be a yes man and let someone, you know, tell you what to do. Well, that's not going to work. You got me? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that's why. So, but most people want to know the right they don't care about trying to do the yeah, job. Yeah, that's true. They're just looking at the beginning. I ain't, listen, I'm not going to stick myself in a way that I'm going to be harming myself. Yeah. Because, you know, you know, so there it is, you know. I see you got a story in here about Chet Brewer, close to the end of the book. Chet Brewer? Right. You know Chet Brewer? Don't know him, but, I, you know, you hear things, or, you know, scan, and you've seen some things, but no, I don't Well, know he him. talked about Chicago in the 30s. Yeah. He mentioned Chicago. Yeah. Back in the 30s, there was a black guy. <laughs> yeah. Who went to a white guy who had a white team, and the guy wanted to try out, and this white man for a whole week told him, boy... Don't you come back here, I'm going to have you arrested. Yeah. And for one solid week, this black man went and sat right by that dugout. And on the seventh day, he, that white coach told that coach, today I'm going to embarrass that boy. They got this big six, eight, hard throwing white boy. <laughs> when they bring him in, I'm going to ask that boy to see it. And we're going to embarrass him. And 
Chet Brewer tell the story and then the game is tied. Yeah. In the seventh inning. And the white guy said, this is the opportunity I've been waiting for. Hey, boy, grab a bat. All oh, disrespectful thing. Yes. Disrespecting this man. Yes. This young man jumped out of the, out of the thing, grabbed the first bat he came, took a couple of practice swings, right-hand hitter, right-hand pitcher, and then he gets in, and the very first pitch, he hits a line drive <laughs> of the right center field fence. This white coach says, ooh! <laughs> Look at this Cuban run. <laughs> <laughs> so he became, with one swing of the bat, a black man without a job to a Cuban with a job. Now, I want to say something about that. Yes. And I've said that, as i told this story many times. It says something about white people. Yes. It really says how deeply inflicted white people are. They knew he was black, but because this white man said he was a Cuban, they accepted it. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. How could you do that? How could you now? You know he's black because a white man said he's a Cuban. <laughs> yeah. You accepted him. Yeah. Yeah, that's... He could not be a Cuban on his own merit. You got me? Yes. Yeah, uh, American on his own merit. Yeah. Could not. Yeah. And it, I've always had a problem. Whenever I tell this story, it, af it affects me because it says something about many white people. They're, they're afflicted because they would accept a white man lying to him that's really let's be realistic they would accept him lying and donald trump proved that i hate to get into political you got me i hear you he lied to him and they believed him you got me yeah and this is what we got into and i know you're sure it's not political so I well i mean it is at time you know but you know but yeah we at this time we're talking about you roger kadar Right, <laughs> and you can no, <laughs> listen to me. I have you, to mention it because no, no, there's no problem with that. Whatever you wish to mention, do it. No, no so no, there's no hesitancy. Yeah, you do your thing. <laughs> well, it's just a sickening thing because he caused a lot of problems to this country because he lied, and they believed him, well, and they knew he was lying. You got me? It, you, just like that man in the '30s. With one swing in the bat, he said, ooh, look at the Cuban run. When we knew that he was not a Cuban, <laughs> they knew he was not a Cuban. Yeah. But they accepted it because what? He said it. <laughs> yeah. Look at that Cuban run. Well, <laughs> what, you, what you have to understand is, uh, huh? I said, what you have to understand is, uh, a lot of people, I mean, yeah, the, the, polit the politicians will lie, you yeah. know, and they will lie, and they will constantly lie, and, and people, you know, hey, the uh, politician is, uh, anyway, I'm going to leave that where it's at, but anyway, they'll lie, just like Biden's lying now, and all of those before him, and it's unfortunate, you know, when you're trying to really accomplish something, our country today is in bad shape because of a lot of these guys. I want to talk to you about Bobby, uh, Roy. Uh, uh, what's his name? He was at a, uh, uh, Bo Bobby, Roy, and Willie, all, uh, they all came up through the leagues of uh, Pop Siler, of uh, Baton Rouge native. Tell me about those guys, you know. Well, okay. Bobby, Bobby, Roy, and Willie. Uh, okay, you were talking about Bobby Tolan, Roy White, and those guys. Oh, no, oh, they all came, no, they came, well, no, no, uh, uh. Chet Brewer. Right, you were talking about Chet, Chet right? Uh, right. Uh -huh. Yeah, Chet, you threw me off when you said bad news, so I have to uh, yeah. read. <laughs> Chet Brewer brought all those kids. Uh -huh. Bobby Tolan, Bobby Tolan, Bobby um, Darwin. Uh, Roy White, Willie Crawford. Roy White. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, 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 Willie Crawford, uh, Wayne Simpson, uh, uh, Mickey Curitan. Mm -hmm. uh, 
all of those great players, Willie Davis, all of them great players in the Los Angeles area, mm -hmm. they came through his program. You know, they came through his program. Uh, Bob Watson, uh, you know, they all came through... Uh, 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 they all came through his program. Yeah. He had, he he was the guy in in Los Angeles, doing all the good things for them. You know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You know, and uh, I tell you, you see, a lot of people don't get credit, give him credit for the great jo job he did. Right. You know, and and when I became coach in eighty uh, eighty five eighty four. In 87, I found a way to go to California. I went to Los Angeles. I went to talk to them guys. You know, I never got a lot of players from there because everything had changed. The landscape had changed because Los Angeles was changing. California was changing. So, you know, I didn't get a lot of those players out of there. My, the players I got was out of Chicago and Detroit mm -hmm. and Atlanta yeah. because that's where the landscape had changed. You know, and for me, it was easier accessible for me to get to Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta, than California. You got me? Yes. And I knew what I was getting. You know, California kids were different, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I really didn't get any kids out of California after that, but uh, Chet Brewer, did a lot of good things, you know. A lot of good things. What do you think? The kid from California probably the uh, the weather is different or something like no, that. No, it was what. something. The only player I got Coco Chris out of there. Okay. But uh, you know, I, I just didn't couldn't get him. Yeah. It was it, it was it, more the weather it was the. The, the the culture, the yeah. culture of everything had changed. You got me You're right. Plus, they got such a big system out there in California. Well, no, no, no. It's more than that. Okay. When the academic became an issue, when the academic became an issue, that was the what killed California. The academic wasn't right for those inner city kids. They didn't have. They weren't giving them the right things so they could be academically eligible. You got that? Okay, you're talking about that Prop 42? In, yeah. in the public schools. I got you. You know. So, I got to give Detroit and Chicago and Atlanta credit. That's the, good. The one state, state that sustained me for the longest was Atlanta. Oh, okay. I mean, Atlanta sustained me for the longest. In the 90s, in the 80s, it was Detroit and, 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 and uh, uh, Chicago. The 90s, it was uh, Atlanta. In the 2000 early, it was Houston. So I kept bouncing. I kept finding the pockets <laughs> yeah. where I could get the players. You got me? Yeah. In other words, you're shaking the back woods, huh? <laughs> well, it was in the city. Yeah. I never got a lot of, you know, Mississippi provided me with some good players. I have to say, Mississippi did provide me with some good players. Uh, you know, Got to give Mississippi credit. Yeah. You know. That's, you were talking about the NCAA and how some of the crap that they did, you know. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can quote it here. Uh our team, uh, our, our team's resplendent, resplendent blue and gold Negro League style uniforms were the only things that were reminiscent of a racially divisive past. The sound of that man's voice more so the vile slurs hurled at me seemed tele uh, teleported from another era. I was, uh, it was surreal. Uh, it was talking about a period in your life that had, uh, I think it was, uh, let me see. If it weren't for the, uh, the, if we weren't ready before then, the NCAA uh, regional opener, we surely were now because you, you guys had had some issues there with uh, some of the folks there at the uh, NCAA. Uh, and in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Okay, yeah, okay, yes. Okay, what what we did, you know, and I had brought back the Negro League and throwback uh, to black baseball. Right. 
you know, everybody had forgotten about it, but I didn't want the Negro League to die. Right. And I brought it back. Good. I wanted people to remember the history. Why we existed was because of what the Negro League did. Yeah. Those people gave their, they gave it all for us. You got me? Mm -hmm. So in 2003, we played the number six team in the nation, Southern Miss, in Hattiesburg. And uh, I made the decision that we were going to wear throwback uniforms. And the kids were complaining how hot it was. The uniform were hot, hot. And I looked at them, I said, uh, just think how difficult it was when the Negro Leagues had to go and take the heat for you guys. Mm -hmm. More than the uniform, all of the other things they had to take. You weren't about two or three hours of something that's going to be worn. We wearing the uniforms, okay? I said, there is no doubt. We wearing them. And we wore the uniforms. Well, we got some words called to us that we ain't going to repeat the N-word and everything. Uh, they didn't, they didn't call you the N-word, did they? Huh? They didn't call you the N word, right? They call you. They call you the full word, right? Uh huh? <laughs> they call you. They call you the full word, right? Yeah, nigga. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah say it. Don't be afraid to say it. You know. Well, yeah. uh, I, I know. Uh, they use that N word, man. Well, you know, and let me tell you, the the thing that's so disturbing is that the NCA assign you what you call when. Uh, when people go, let their kids go out on dates, and they, they have someone go with them, they call them what? Chaperone. Chaperone. Right. They'll sign us some chaperones. And that guy was our chaperone. And the, soon that damn, soon that damn game started, I heard the N word called. Yeah. And I looked, and I saw that it was the chaperone. And I said, oh, my God, all I could think is he's poisoning my kids. You got to understand. What else can you think? You got me? Yeah. He gave them something. And he kept using the N word that the family of the kids wanted to fight. And the people from southern Mississippi never did anything. So after the first inning, I called my players. I said, this is what it's all about. This is what it's about, guys. You can't let him just prove a point here. See, the Negro League uniform meant something then. It meant something then. Yeah. Before, it didn't mean nothing to the players. It was too hot, <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah. But when they heard the N-word, Yeah. It really meant something. It meant what those people took over the years, you got? Sometimes it takes things happening to make people understand what they really are dealing with. Now they understood about what those uniforms stood for. You know, and I've always talked about history with my kids. Okay. That you are going to be a part of history. No other black school. In our lifetime, it's going to be able to do what we've been able to do. You got me? Yeah. We did it with no budget. We did it with no no crime. We just went on and did it. And we beat the best teams available. Yeah. We played them and beat them. You got me? Yes. Even though our people were in a position to help us and they wouldn't. You got me? Yeah. That's... They were in a position to help us at Southern. Yeah. But they wouldn't do it because, you know what, they didn't care about baseball. They only cared about football, and football was never going to take them anywhere. Yeah. And that was the sad part that they couldn't get. You had baseball would take you somewhere, but they didn't want it. You got me? Yeah. But I don't blame them because I'm going to chalk it up to ignorance. Uh, that's exactly what it is. You chalk it up to ignorance. 
Now, your ch in your chapter nine, speaking of the NCAA, you were talking about the uh, before the SWAC and all of the you know the different uh, conferences had an automatic bid, you know, in baseball. Uh, what, why do you think it came about in 1990? No, we had automatic bid before 1990. I said, yeah, why do you think they ended it? Uh, racism is one, and they used, uh, they used something that uh, I don't really know what they used. Because they were going somewhere, and they used something, and they took it away. Uh, that, I mean, even after we had beaten Cal State Fullerton, they should have beaten Texas, uh, and they took that automatic bid away. And there was a guy, and I feel bad, I can't give call his name correctly. That's all right. Um, he was, he used to be the head of Turner Broadcasting. And he was head in the NCAA. Oh, what a good guy. He was over the SEC. Okay. He was over the SEC. Okay. And we would have to go in the 90s to find out what his name is, okay? Yeah. He was the one that made them give it back to us. Took what name? Don't tell me one more than powerful. One person is not. He made them do it. You got me? Yeah, yeah. He told them it was wrong what they were doing. And he made them give it. That's how we got it back. Right. You know, after they had taken it. Right. And that's he, like, he told him, how could you expect these people to do when you they don't have the necessities? You got me? Yeah. See, that's the kind of stuff, man. You know, when you start asking a kid to carry 50 pounds when he's only capable of carrying 5 pounds, it's not fair. You got me? Yeah, he yeah. can only carry 5. Why would you put 50 on his back, you got me? Right, and, and everyone else is only carrying five, you know. So That's right, everybody else is carrying five. Yeah. So there you go, I'm glad you had it there, you know? Yeah. So those are the kind of things, man. You see, some of the things that are happening in this country now is a throwback to some of the things that happened prior, you got me? Yeah. You know, don't deny people. Don't deny people. You don't help the country. You hate the country, you got me? Oh yeah, I agree. If you let people, give people what they deserve, this is a better place to live. It's a better place to live, I'm telling you. It's my, it's my, it's my country, so I mean, hey, I love it. It's a piece of crap, but it's mine, and I love it. Well, it's my country, too, and I love it. Too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say it's a piece of crap. It's got issues. But well, I mean, I yeah, well, there's no, yeah, I'll go along with that. It's just, it's just like all the other countries. They, they got issues, yeah, but this yeah. is mine, and, uh. They and, got issues, and they, they can do so much better, you know. <laughs> they can do better, you know. Yeah. You know, because I've been to countries that are crap. But oh, yeah. Well, you're right, you're right about that. so much potential. Yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> that yeah. Uh, not to be, I didn't want to be a bigot, you know. I wanted. I got you. I got you. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to put us all in the same ca you know, yeah. category, you know. There's some good folks wherever you go, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What I tell you, it's, it's a very interesting book, very good book, you know. And uh, has it done pretty good for you? But people, are uh, you... People buying it? Yeah, people don't get away, you know, and, you know, the people buy it is, is the white people more than black, and, and it's a shame, but, you know, that, that's... <laughs> hey. <yeah. laughs> You know, uh, well, you, you asked me and I can tell you. Well, no, you, hey, that, look, Coach. You're not talking to somebody that don't understand a lot. Of, I, I am sick. It's you know, I am sick of a lot of this stuff that... Uh, you know, we feel less than, you know, and I'm just sick of it, you know, it's, uh, you don't have to feel that way, you're just as good or, as anyone, and you should see it that way, why not support, you know, support your institutions, yeah. you know, I'm looking at how people are clamoring for the uh, 
so-called HBCUs now. But when the hell you think, how you think we've been able to survive this long? We supported right. it. We did the best right. we could, you know. That's right, yeah. You know, so now all of a sudden everybody, well, they, you know, you see these high-profile athletes and actors, you know, they all want to throw some money. But money is not the answer to every damn thing. Yeah. You know, you need more than money. You need to have something there other than just money. You need money to pay for the the, the mortar. You that's know, right. but for the bill of character of a person, you know, that's a different thing. That takes another kind of commitment, you know. Right, right. And, uh, you know, that's why it's an honor, to, you know, speaking to you because I think you've done a, you know, you turned out, you know, quite a few students. And, uh, and that's a good thing, you know, so. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's. It's all good, you know. We just gotta try and work through it, and you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really a, a process, you know. Yes, yes, I agree with you on that. It's a, it, exactly what it is, and it's you know, it's a process, and you know, it's up to us to do what we can for ourselves. You know, right. you know, it's exactly. like you, it's like you could have stayed in that in that you should you could have stayed a sharecropper. You know, That's right. You could, your, I view, that. Yeah, your, view, your view and your limitation could have been right there in that little town and no further. And that's what happened to a lot of folks, even in these that's big right. cities. You know, they happen that way. They don't go out of their community, you know. I'm telling you, a lot of people stayed there. They didn't move. And yeah. they tried to keep me, you know, told my mother I was crazy. <laughs> you know, they didn't want me to get out of there, you know. <laughs> There's something wrong with that boy, you know, that boy, that yeah, boy that's lost his mind. <laughs> Man, you know, you see, you heard that story before. Oh, yeah. Well, you yeah. said that too easy. Oh, yeah. What's well, wrong with that boy? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, like I said, I'm dead out of the south. <laughs> yeah. That boy ain't thinking right. Right. So what's wrong? He's been in the heat too long. <laughs> Not in the heat? Come on. <laughs> Oh my goodness! That boy been in the heat. Yeah. Too long. So yeah, but now, uh, how long were you at Southern, and what was your record when you finally gave it up? Well, it was nine hundred something. I don't know the record now. Oh, okay. It's nine hundred somewhere, and I do know that. You know. So uh, yeah, nine hundred somewhere, so it's a big. Uh, yeah, big number. Yeah, big number. And I, I, I had a 40 years of working relations, 50 years with a student at Southern. So a 50-year relationship, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, a long time. Yeah, it's good, you know. And it's a good thing, you know, that you're able to do it and uh, enjoy it, too. I mean, you know, this I enjoyed it. Yeah, I had a, a lot of good things, you know. Yeah. Couldn't wait for that sun to come out when it got a little warmer, huh? Huh? <laughs> and you couldn't wait until that sun came out in the spring hits. Well, it didn't matter when it came or what year, what time of year it was. It didn't really matter. Mm. I mean, I was a little different guy, you know. Mm. Yeah, it didn't really matter. Now you spoke of your, you said something about your son. I think earlier, do your any of your children are they involved in athletics or anything? No, 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 uh, no. Yeah. no, no athletics. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> nothing, and I didn't try to push. My wife had a, a philosophy that the people were not going to be fair to my son because. They were going to expect him to be as good as me or do what I did, and it wasn't going to be fair. That's true. Going, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times people do want you to follow, you know, your father or your mother, you know, whatever yeah. it is, you know, so. And that's not, you're right, that's not fair because that's yeah, not who not I fair. am. Yeah, that's what, what, you know, and a lot of people, and I mean, you know, you know, so I said, okay. I never pushed him. I mean, you know, the only thing I told my son, I said, let me tell you something. To be an athlete, you're going to give up your summers. You're going to give up holidays. You're going to give up vacation. <laughs> it's a lot of things you got to give up. Right. <laughs> you know, you got to give them up. And if you want to be that, if not, you ain't going to be there. Let it go. Right. Yeah, that's true, you know. Well, you know, you. Yeah. I want to thank you very much. You got anything okay. finally you would like to say? No, it's just been... uh. You know, it's really been an honor to be able to talk with you and uh, give let you. I've been able to talk in extent a little different. This has been a little different, 
about all the interviews I've done about my book, so I appreciate that, okay? Yes, I appreciate it. You being able to feel comfortable to talk about it, you know, the way you want to. Well, you allowed me to. I appreciate that, okay? Yes, sir. And speaking all of... All right. Yeah, let me get this last thing out of you. What do you think about the baseball, uh, Major League okay. Baseball pulling out of Georgia, which I think is a bunch of crap, but uh, you just, you, it's not about me. It's about what you think. <laughs> well, it's not about what I think. It's about what... You see, what I try to tell people, what Major League Baseball and what NBA did in Charlotte is about... You know, they're not looking at for one year. This thing is about a long-term effect, the voting rights thing. And trust me, I'm non-political, okay? <laughs> but they're looking at this is a long-term effect if you let people do, deny people. You're right. You got me? Yes. That's what they're looking at. It's going to be a long-term thing. So they're saying if we let it happen, it's going to be a long-term. It's going to affect people for many years. So we need to send a message. And so uh, I think it's right based upon the merits. Uh, you know, and, but I don't have a vote in there. I don't have a fight. I don't have a dog in the fight. So, you know, you know, I really think that there is no need to change what they have been doing with the voting. That's, that's the thing. Why? There was no voter fraud. Why would you change them? You got me? Well, from what I understand, it was uh, really increasing the people's uh, ability to do things. Now, like you guys do in Louisiana, down there, y'all got uh, Sunday voting and all that stuff, you know? So, but I, Why not let people vote, man? Why not if they want to? Why yeah. not let them do that? Right. That's true. I agree why with that. not let them do that? Yeah. You know, why do that? Why, why even go there? So... Maybe that's why Major League Baseball decides we can't let that happen. Mm. Okay? Yeah. So, All that right. is. That's All right. Since, since okay? we were talking baseball, I had to get that in there. <laughs> All right. Not a problem. <laughs> All, right, All right, man. Right. You know, when you see it, you'll see that uh, you got an S on your cap. And what you think yeah. I got on my cap? An S. No. Yeah, I'm grambling. No. Jackson. You doggone right. Big hey, G. Hey, G. You from Mississippi. That's right. right. But I don't hold that against you. Yeah, y'all beat the hell out of us as fast as we get. Huh? Right. We'll, we'll, get, got you. We'll, we'll get you in the fall. All right. All right, Doc. Thank you very much, Coach. All right, bye. And hey, thank you very much. Bye-bye now.